so again, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming uh, this morning. Uh, before I get into our formal talk, uh, since I haven't been here for a month and I know there have been other uh, presentations uh, on these Sundays, as well as everybody has continued on with your life, and uh, sometimes, if not always, issues arise about how, to, uh, how do I practice, how do I deal with this uh, situation in life uh, that may be causing uh, some difficulty. So, or just uh, any questions about mindfulness practice, meditation. So again, uh, anything, uh, anybody have any questions? I'm glad to see that this is a group of people who have resolved uh, many issues. And good, and their and the path is clear in life. And uh, I mean, we can we could maybe talk about politics or something. <laughs> good. Then. Uh, w w then uh, you know, those who've been coming regularly, that uh, uh, since the last fall, uh, the talks and the intensives and the retreats have all, uh, this year has been dedicated to uh, uh, kind of examining the fundamentals of our tradition. Uh, last fall, early winter, uh, we focused on uh, mindfulness, uh, mindfulness meditation, mindful living, and then in the winter, spring, uh, on the basic teachings of uh, Buddhism. Uh, but really going into the core teachings uh, in a very thorough way. Uh, so in line with that, uh, I want to share with you a, a traditional uh, story from the uh, Chinese Zen tradition. Uh, maybe you are familiar with it. Uh, uh, this is from the Tang Dynasty, which is, uh, I think, 6th, 7th century. Or maybe later. I didn't even think about to check when the Tang Dynasty was, but it was a while ago. Uh, it was, it was, uh, you know, it was probably later than the eighth century because that was when Bodhidharma came. Anyhow, it was uh, considered one of the great periods of the flourishing of Zen and Buddhism in China. And uh, the story goes, there was this uh, Zen master called the Bird's Bird's Nest Master or something, uh, because he uh, meditated in a tree. Uh, so. And supposedly the birds would consider his hair sort of like a nest. I guess he didn't move too much. So anyhow, he was quite he was quite famous uh, as a as a Zen master. And uh, this uh, governor, I guess the governor of the province, uh, uh, knew about him, heard about him. Uh, he was a very uh, devoted to Buddhism, and a very traditional, uh, you know, you want to uh, visit a great master and, uh, and uh, ask some questions. Uh, so uh, he traveled uh, to see the bird nest uh, teacher, and uh, he asked him, as is very traditional, uh, something to the effect, uh, you know, what is the highest teaching of Buddhism? What is the deepest teaching of Buddhism? You know, uh, that kind of question, you know, go, go right to the heart of things. And so the uh, bird's nest uh, master, Master Bird's Nest, uh, said to him, um, he looked at him and said to him, uh, avoid evil, practice good, and purify the mind. At this point, the uh, the uh, governor uh, was taken aback, and he said, uh, "But you know, even a, even a, an eight-year-old child knows that, right?" And then the master said, uh, "Yes, it may be true that an eight-year-old child uh, can repeat that, uh, but it is difficult even for an eighty-year-old uh, to practice." And so that is the uh, that is the anecdote. And I think it's uh, I think it's profound, even though it's uh, simple. So you have this governor uh, coming uh, to the master uh, for teaching. Uh, he asked the uh, uh, he asked the master a question. Uh, the master answers him, and we get right away what? He didn't get the answer he wanted, did he? And that I think is there's a lot of profundity in that. Uh, 
most of us, many of us, uh, come to a spiritual path uh, uh, for good reasons. And yet, uh, many of us have uh, many uh, ideas, uh, preconceptions about uh, what, uh, what the path is and, uh, you know, what the teachings uh, are that we need. And uh, so therefore, uh, our, our, our uh, entrance into the Dharma is not pure. It is somewhat defiled by our own ideas, which is very interesting because it is our own ideas that have gotten us into trouble in the first place. Right? Uh, we have been listening to the ideas, the ideas, the dramas, the melodramas, the hurts, the <laughs> frustrations, the uh, this and that of our mind for years, and we've. Uh, 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 a thought uh, we were uh, doing right or, uh, uh, you know, and yet uh, if we were honest, we would have to say, no, uh, I have uh, unfortunately been giving myself uh, lots of bad advice over the years because things have not turned out uh, the way I thought as well as I have maybe taken advice or listened to advice uh, from people that uh, probably were not uh, uh, that wise or insightful uh, to really benefit me. So even that is the case, then we come to the Dharma, a path of liberation and freedom. And again, uh, we think uh, we're, we're, we're coming for good reasons, and, and we probably are, uh, but yet our minds, uh, we ask questions, uh, but we have an expectation what, what the answer should be. Right. Our minds are not open. Uh, in Zen, it's called uh, the mind that is a greatly uh, prized. It's called, and many of you may know this, called the beginner's mind. The beginner's mind is, is like a child's mind. A beginner, when you're a beginner, you're totally open, right? Everything is fresh, everything is new. Uh, wow, you know, you're a beginner. You don't have ideas about anything. It's really a very fresh place to be because it's a place where then you are very open to absorption. Right? Uh, so again, uh, we see that uh, this, uh, this uh, governor, uh, who's, uh, I guess, a devoted practitioner of Buddhism, uh, even though he was coming to the master uh, with a question, he already had an expectation what the right answer was which is, again, uh, what we often do uh, in our communication, not just with masters, but with each other. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we have so many preconceptions and ideas of what we want the other person to say or do uh, that, <laughs> that our conversations are not very open and free, are they? They're not very accepting. So beginner's mind is not just something uh, to only be practiced uh, in the realm of uh, Buddhism or the meditative path. Beginner's mind is the way is the path of the world, which means I am open to receiving uh, from others. I'm not prejudging, I'm not preconceiving, because many times, even as we are listening to other people share, we are already formulating our interpretation, we're spinning it on our way, or if we don't like it, we're already uh, rehearsing our response. Right? Uh, we have not really heard the other person and looked deeply into what they're saying. So, uh, so that's, I think, what's going on here. Right? He says, uh, he, asked the he comes all this way to see the master. And again, uh, this is not like uh, getting on 275 and getting off at Sly uh, and popping in. Uh, in those days, uh, you know, the masters were <laughs> up in the mountain, and if you wanted to go see them, uh, it took some effort. You know, uh, some hardship, uh, some exertion. Uh, so uh, obviously this governor, uh, to, to, to make uh, the trip, he had that. Uh, but yet when he got it and the master said uh, what he said, uh, that was not a good enough answer, right? Obviously he thinks he knows more than the master, so you wonder why he even bothered to come. <laughs> So let us look at this uh, master. We know he's a great Zen master. He lives up in a tree. He spends his life meditating. Uh, 
uh, he's already sized up the governor. Again, uh, Buddhist teaching, uh, going back to the Buddha, is, is always delivered in what is called uh, upaya, or uh, appropriateness and skillfulness. What that means is uh, that uh, the Buddhist teaching, going back to the Buddha, was not, a, was not based on dogma, was not based on revealed truth. It was based on a profound understanding, direct realization of the way things were and are. Uh, and how that is presented uh, can be presented in many different ways. So the Buddha uh, was always, uh, when anybody ever asked him a question, and most of uh, the Buddhist teachings that have come down to us were in response to people asking the uh, Buddha questions, and the same way with the other teachers, uh, like this one, uh, the Buddha's answer was always appropriate uh, to that person. To, to their life situation, to where they were at, to their own uh, personal development, as well as skillful. Skillful means trying to move them along, trying to get them to see something that they don't see. So that is why uh, somebody could come in and, so, and the master of the Buddha would give one answer, somebody would come in next and give, uh, you, know, uh, you know, ask the same question, and to give them a totally different answer. Right? And, you, and somebody might say, but that's... What's that about? Well, what that is about is it's not about the answer, it's about uh, how he's trying to help wake up uh, this person, right? Uh, so obviously uh, he's already, you know, he's already sized the governor up. <laughs> and he's not giving the governor what he wants, is he? Which is a very wonderful Zen uh, way. A Zen teacher should uh, be keeping us off balance. A Zen teacher should be shaking us up. A Zen teacher should be uh, kind of challenging us in ways uh, that break us out of our, our habitual way of seeing things, our habitual way of seeing ourselves, of life. Uh, all, all the conceptual framework and stories we tell about who we are and what life is, and etc. I mean, somebody's got to break us out of this one. Right, and that, and that is the role of a Zen master, or a teacher. Uh, uh, so again, he's, he sized the guy up, and he gives him rather a profound, uh, and you know Zen teachers, if you read the koans and the mundos, you know, the interchanges, you know, they're great. They give shouts, uh, uh, they give all kind of enigmatic uh, statements, and all, right? Uh, which is, you know, a lot of their answers are very paradoxical, uh, right? Uh, this is maybe probably what he was expecting, and said, what does he give him? He gives him, uh, you know, avoid evil, practice good, and purify the mind stream. So in ancient China, in, in the Buddhist culture, uh, this would be like uh, saying, uh, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. You know, it's like everybody knows that, right? It's like common. I mean, so that's why he's like, what? You know, I mean, I, I came all this way and you're telling me what, uh, you know, you know what everybody knows? And then he, he delivers the... Uh, the key piece, right? All right? Yeah. Everybody may know, may know it, uh, but who really practices it, right? right? Everybody may know you do unto others as you'd have others do unto you, uh, but how many people actually practice it? Right? Uh, so again, and I'll come back to the, to the statement, uh, but again, I think this is uh, profound. Uh, we so easily uh, fool ourselves uh, with words. Uh, we read the books, we hear the teachings, we talk the talk, uh, you know, and yet uh, do we practice it? Practice it means do we live it? Uh, not just when we come to the meditation hall, uh, not just where we're, you know, but, uh, you know, in our private life, in our hidden life. Uh, are we congruent uh, with the values and the teachings uh, we say we want to live by or are living by? So uh, this is what the Master is, go is like, you know, yeah, the highest teachings of Buddhism. Yeah, he wants, he wants a stick, he wants the quats, he wants the profound inner teaching, right? And the Master is saying, uh, you know, have you even done the basics yet? 
Not that you don't know the basics, not that you don't know the fundamentals, uh, but do you really practice it? In Buddhism that is called, have you cleaned your bowl? And you know in our, uh, in our uh, Florida Community Mindfulness, uh, in our three we have in our, uh, and I guess it's all on the website, kind of the developmental model of teaching and practice. Uh, the first level of practice is cleaning the bowl, right? The bowl is our minds, and our minds are the, are the bowl that is going to receive these precious teachings that have the power to transform, heal, and liberate us, right? Uh, but before they are poured into the mind stream, is the bowl clean, right? In other words, most of us uh, don't leave our dirty dishes in the sink, uh, or even if we do leave our dirty dishes in the sink, uh, usually before we would use them again, we would wash them out. Right? If you went to anybody's house and they uh, took out a filthy bowl and you saw them, uh, you know, ladling out the food into that bowl, you may <laughs> be a little disturbed. Right? Uh, because uh, that, that bowl has other food in it that has its own flavor. Right? As well as uh, if it has not been cleaned, uh, it, it may be dirty. <laughs> it may be unhealthy. As well as have various kinds of flavors uh, that uh, do not, uh, you do not want to get into the fresh food that's being prepared. So that is why uh, this cleaning the bowl, uh, cleaning the mind, uh, kind of uh, freeing it from a lot of its. Uh, contaminations, freeing the mind from a lot of its emotional afflictions and egocentricities and, uh, and uh, uh, wounds, deep emotional wounds, uh, is so essential in this uh, practice to, uh, to do first. So uh, as we receive the teachings, we can actually practice them, right? Uh, and so this is uh, what is being shared uh, with the governor. Uh, avoid evil, uh, again, that's just a translation. Uh, it means what? Stop doing harm. I mean, that's really, in Buddhism, that's the evil. Stop doing harm. Stop doing harm to yourself. Stop doing harm to others. Right? How do we do harm to ourselves and others? Uh, through our actions. Right? Uh, in our speech. In uh, the way uh, with our body. Uh, the things that we consume. The things that we drink. The things that we inject. The things that we uh, physically uh, do with our body. Stop doing harm uh, with our speech, our words, even, even more uh, capability often for harm. Have we transformed the organ of speech that our speech is uh, no longer, at least not hurting, not doing damage, right? And again, obviously the deeper one is our, our mind. Uh, but at least, uh, you know, stop at least at the level of uh, actions of our body and actions of our speech, which are the most overt, most seen, and uh, obviously most damaging to others. Uh, have we put a stop to it? Right. So that's key. Secondly, practice good. So just stopping doing afflictive uh, actions uh, is not enough, is it? Uh, still, we still may be miserable human beings, uh, but at least uh, we're, we're doing uh, not, not as much harm as we is. So the second is, you know, are we on a path of cultivating positive actions and qualities, right? This is, this is uh, the second thing. 
you know, uh, uh, are we cultivating uh, 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 in actions of our body? Are we uh, eating uh, healthy? <laughs> are we uh, drinking and imbibing things that are healthy for us? Uh, or are we using these hands uh, not to do violence to other human beings or to be aggressive to other human beings, uh, but to take care of, to protect, to, to, to nurture, right? I mean, what are we using uh, this body, are we using it uh, in, in, in a good way? And again, in our speech, right? Are our words uh, now uh, uh, positive, constructive, helpful, kind, right? I mean, are, are we using this organ of speech, uh, you know, once we've shut it up, <laughs> uh, from making, and we've made the commitment to no longer do harm uh, with our words, but are we learning how to speak uh, in a compassionate, constructive, positive way in all our interactions? Uh, not only uh, in intimate relations, but with everyone, even at work, even with, with anybody we meet. Uh, are, we, are we committed to realizing uh, that this, this mouth and the sounds that come out of it in the form of words have the capability of creating good, right? even at the simplest level, right? When we encounter another human being to, uh, to greet them, uh, to say something, uh, even, you know, how are you? But not like, uh, how are you? But really like, how are you? You know, or... Because so many things we say, you know, have a nice day, uh, have a good one. Right? We, people say it, but there's nothing behind it other than kind of social form. Right? But, but can we learn to say these things with meaning? And we know that, right? Because uh, when we know the difference when someone's just saying, uh, saying things just because it's the form of saying things and when they really mean it. You know, we like it when they mean it. We like it when somebody really shows interest in it. You know, how are you? You know, like I really want to know how you are. I'm not just saying it to get on to whatever we're supposed to talk about. You know, that's, that's the important thing, right? But how are you? Uh, so again, uh, this capacity to, uh, to use uh, our bodies and our mouths, the activity of our bodies and speech uh, to create goodness in the world, right? The opposite of doing harm, right? And so it really takes, again, this, this real awareness of in the actions of our body, uh, what, what are the activities that do uh, uh, create harm for myself and others, and make it a commitment to stopping that. I'm just not gonna do that anymore. Right? I'm just not gonna do it anymore. And if I find, because of my habit energy, I, I lose control and I do it, as soon as I realize that, I will, I will stop and if I've done it to another human being, I will apologize to them. And I will say to them, I will do better, forgive me. And I will do better in the future. You know, complete acknowledgement, there's nothing to hide. And uh, sh to share with people, I am, I'm working on this. <laughs> I am committed, right? To stop doing harm, and I am committed to uh, doing good. And again, um, you know, many people uh, even have jobs where they do good in the world, uh, but yet, in their own personal relations, do not do good. Often with the people they are closest and most intimate with. Uh, this is a commitment uh, to do good uh, everywhere. With everyone. Including ourselves. Uh, many people, uh, uh, you know, have this thing where uh, they, uh, they have a certain way of treating uh, people. Uh, but they don't consider themselves for some reason a person, you know, so they never think about, oh, you know, well, maybe I should be kind to myself or helpful to myself or uh, nurturing to myself or helping myself stop. I mean, you know, uh, we are so good with our friends and families and colleagues uh, to give them endless advice, right, about how their life could be better, right? We, we are great at that. And yet we ourselves don't take it. It's, it's probably like the governor uh, himself, you know what I mean? Uh, but do we have that relationship with ourself? Because that is our uh, primary relationship in this life. 
right? It is, it is that uh, self uh, that we are always with. And it is that self uh, whose actions are good or, n or, or not good, skillful or unskillful, uh, which will have the greatest effect on us. So to not uh, treat this self as uh, somebody primarily that I need to uh, have, a, have a very positive relationship with, uh, that I have to have a relationship uh, with this self and with its body uh, in which uh, I completely give up doing harm to it and I only make it a, uh, a focus of goodness. Oftentimes, uh, we treat our body and we treat uh, our actions as if it's somehow uh, not within the scope or the sphere uh, of our awareness. We kind of skip over this one. You know, maybe it's because uh, when we look out, we don't see it. Right? Like, I'm looking out now and I see you. So it's very easy for me to think, oh, my job is just to uh, focus on you. Uh, but I forget that this awareness that uh, is aware of you is centered in this. And if I don't take good care of this, uh, then my capacity to take good care of that uh, will be compromised. So we have to notice uh, that this is the instrument through which we operate in this life. Uh, this is a wonderful gift. Uh, that has been given to us by our parents. Uh, whatever we think about our parents, uh, they gave us life, and they gave us these bodies, and they gave us the capacity for speech and these minds. And uh, it is our job uh, to turn them into worthy instruments, uh, especially in this world today. Uh, the uh, uh, to uh, be dedicated to uh, uh, creating a body-mind that is based in well-being, uh, health, healthiness, and that uh, has wisdom and compassion as its operating principles uh, is essential for the survival of this species. Uh, so again, the commitment to giving up harm. Secondly, the commitment to uh, cultivating good, goodness <laughs> in all the actions uh, of our body and our speech. And the third instruction was what? Purify the mind. In Buddhism, uh, those of you who've been uh, here today know uh, <clears throat> The uh, primary practice uh, that we use uh, and we focus on so much are practices that relate to the mind. Mindfulness is a key. Awareness, self-awareness, concentration, right? all these things relate to how we uh, relate to, understand, become aware of, and transform this mind, okay? Because uh, it is understanding of Buddhism that of the three, body, speech, and mind, mind is the king, the queen. It is the essential one, right? <clears throat> this is, even though the body is a complex, uh, ancient, I mean, complex, miraculous, uh, uh, you know, of, of all these uh, systems of which we have no idea what they're up to, and yet they're very self-regulating and do quite well without us. Uh, so uh, all we need to do is give it the good fuel and good care. Uh, but in terms of actions, right, what my body does, what, what my mouth does, right, that is really under the control of what? Or should be under the control of what? Our minds. So it is the mind that is key here. Right? Because it is the mind that really is the projector, the activist, the activator of, of our actions in the world. 
And really, if you think about uh, happiness or unhappiness, uh, joy or suffering, uh, well-being, ease, I mean, all these things, patience, loving kindness, uh, anger, fear, you know, those are all going on where? Mind. These are, these are mental events. Right? And so our primary concern has to be the mind because this is, you know, uh, or else we're always, you know, it's like holding back the dam, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, we have our impulses, we have the words we want to say, we, we really like to let this one have it, uh, but, you know, mm, right? Right, like I, I was speaking to somebody yesterday who thought they knew something about Dharma, and they were saying, yes, you know, I'm, I'm, I've learned, uh, you know, when I'm upset, uh, I know how to stop, and take a deep breath, right? I said, well, that's good, uh, but that's not Dharma. Dharma is learning how not to get upset at all, right? It's about freedom, it's about liberation, it's about how to live another way. It's not a control mechanism, right? No, obviously, if we're out of control, uh, as a good as a good beginning, it's good to have some control mechanisms. <laughs> so I'm not saying that that's uh, not good. Okay, it, it is good, uh, but that is that's just a step along the way. Right. So the third statement is what? Purify the mind. Right. Now, what is this mind? Okay, that which right now is seeing and hearing, this is your mind. Is that clear? It is not an object, it is not an entity. It is this right now uh, that is aware, and that sees, and hears, and tastes, and feels, and thinks, right, and emotes, right? This is all your mind. Okay. Everybody know what their mind is? Right? This is it. This is what has to be purified. Okay. Are we clear? This is your mind. Right now it is listening, it is seeing, it may be thinking, sensing. This is your mind. Every thought, every feeling, every sensation occurs in your mind. Okay. Now, up to now, uh, it's kind of been a free-for-all, right? And it's like, how did I get here? You know, how did I get a mind like this? <laughs> right? And, and then uh, we have all these feelings and all these dramas and melodramas and emotion, positive and negative, and all these impulses and desires, and you know, right? Okay. These are all in our mind. These all are our mind in a certain way. All right. So the statement is what? Purify. Okay. That obviously implies that there are impurities in our mind. Just the way, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, water uh, that comes fresh from a spring uh, can be very pure, right? delicious, uh, nourishing, refreshing, right? fresh spring water. Uh, but if that water has uh, come out of the earth and has traveled a distance, traveled through barnyards, uh, picked up, uh, you know, <clears throat> traveled through uh, uh, places where there's toxic runoffs from <laughs> pesticides and herbicides and right and chemical spills and right so that uh, pure water that was so nourishing has now become something impure right it doesn't have uh, those uh, nourishing life-giving qualities it now is actually has become something harmful right? is that clear if one knows how right if one knows how to treat uh, water that is contaminated, because one knows in essence uh, there's a purity in the H2O, right? One can put the water through a process 
and it becomes drinkable. Hmm? Uh, that's called what? Water treatment or something? I mean, it's, it's something that is known, or uh, reverse osmosis. I mean, there are all kinds of ways that one can take out the contaminants. So, you know, meditative practice, spiritual practice, this is what it's about. Right? <clears throat> See, many people, they think uh, spiritual practice, it's about doing something, like becoming spiritual, right? Like reading spiritual books and having spiritual thoughts and having spiritual conversations and, you, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like a thing. No. It's about purifying our minds of all its contaminants, right? If we're reading the spiritual books, coming to Dharma, doing all this good stuff, and we haven't taken out the contaminants, or not using the practice to purify the contaminants, you know what I'm saying? It's not going to be beneficial to us. I mean, if I take that contaminated water and I put it in a very fancy vase, right? If I really package it very nicely and put a high price on it, maybe sort of a bluish tinge to the bottle and, you know, and then give it a French name and, you, you know what I'm saying? And, and put a high price on it, it's going to look quite lovely, but yet it's still contaminated water in there. We don't want to, uh, we don't want to. Uh, make our spiritual life, our transformative healing life like that. Uh, where we look, you know, it looks good, uh, but inside uh, it's still uh, rotting, still impure. So the practice is about purifying the mind. So what are the impurities? Right? Well, the biggest impurity there is, is, is not really knowing the way things are. We see... Uh, permanence, where there's really impermanence. We see things as solid entities, when really things are interdependent and really made up of many other things. Nothing stands alone. Uh, we believe uh, uh, that the ego and the self is a real thing. And so we live in a world where everybody is separate self. And we don't really see uh, that that's not really true. And that in truth, uh, we are everything, and everything is us. And there's no separation at all. Right. Because uh, we believe that we are a self, and because we believe in the narrative and the story of ourself, uh, we carry with us uh, often uh, much suffering. We carry with us many stories about who we are and who we're not, uh, many of them uh, negative. Uh, we carry uh, uh, many afflictive emotions uh, from our past that continue uh, to arise and create more uh, afflictive emotions. Uh, within us on a daily basis or in our relationships. They prevent us uh, from uh, doing what we talked earlier, uh, from really uh, in the actions of our, our body, in the actions of our speech, uh, for really using these as instruments of goodness. Uh, we still use them as instruments of harm. Uh, again, because we have not purified our minds. Uh, many people, the idea of purifying the mind uh, is, a, is, a, is a brand new idea. Right? Many of us have grown up with a kind of psychological understanding that all, you know, the jo our job is what? Uh, to cope a little better with this stuff. Oh, I can't change. This is who I am. Right? But I can uh, learn some techniques to cope a little better. Right? No, this is not about that. This is saying that your mind can be purified. The impurities can be removed. And, and that forth, uh, the pure mind is a mind that is primarily uh, uh, manifesting positive mind states, such as uh, ease 
such as well-being, my being is well, such as happiness, such as joy, such as loving kindness, such as compassion, uh, such as patience, understanding. Is that clear? These are the these are the these are the mind states of a purified mind. It's not a big deal. Right? Don't think it's a big deal. You know, water that comes from the spring, you don't have to do anything to it, do it, do you? It is, it is, you know, that is water in its pure state. Our mind is like that, right? Whatever garbage, junk, uh, emotional affliction, wrong thinking, delusions uh, are, 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 uh, are manifesting in your mind, our minds right now, you were not born with them, were you? No. None of us were. We inherited a pure mind from our parents. You know, but then, uh, forgive the language, shit happened. And we forgot. We lost our way. And we just, uh, you know, got involved with all kinds of, based on wrong ideas and wrong notions and wrong modeling, and, uh, you know, a child, young person's mind that is not very developed or intelligent. You know, we just started going down a, you know, we, we, we just took a, a wrong turn. And as the years go on, uh, we got further and further away, right? In the same way, uh, that water that came out of the mountain spring, pure. You know, by the time it's gone through whatever it's gone through and joined all the other streams and, the, you know, by the time it makes it to the ocean, it's no longer pure, is it? Right. And we think, if we don't understand it, that's the way it is. But no, if we follow it to its source, we'll see, oh, it started purely. Right. Please understand that in Buddhism, it is the understanding that our minds are inherently pure. And the practice that we do are to heal and transform so we return to this, this basic wholeness, well-being, purity, clarity, pristine awareness of our natural minds. Uh, is anybody now, uh, like right in this moment, furious about what I'm saying? <laughs> is your mind just taken over with anger and resentment at hearing these words? Uh, is there anybody uh, scared, anxious, terrified uh, by these words? Right? Well, isn't that interesting? Because that means that if, that if you have uh, at times worry, anxiety, fear, uh, anger, resentment, sadness, despair, if they're not present right now, that means they are not permanent things, right? They're not permanent things. They arise according to causes and conditions. When you change your causes and conditions, your mind will change. Okay. So this teaching about uh, avoiding evil, practicing good, purifying the mind stream, you can see, is a profound teaching, isn't it? It doesn't get any profounder than this. Uh, but the governor didn't understand that uh, because he just thought it was, a, you know, a Buddhist aphorism. And because he had known it since he was eight years old and could repeat it, uh, he thought he knew it. But he never stopped until the master, and again, uh, hopefully he did get it. Hopefully, uh, when he didn't get the answer he wanted, 
rather than uh, walking away and going, you know, I don't know what people are talking about this bird's net master. I mean, he's like, uh, you know, he's teaching stuff that I learned in third grade. He's no master. I got to go find myself another master. <laughs> All right, somebody, somebody, and that's people, you know, people go from teacher to teacher, Dharma group to Dharma group, this group, spiritual group, right? They haven't even understood and mastered uh, the first thing that was taught them. We are like that. Uh, this governor uh, heard something when he was eight years old uh, that if he had uh, really understood and practiced, uh, he would have not even needed to go see the, the bird's nest master. But there he was, probably in his 50s or 60s, still chasing after masters, still not listening, <laughs> still thinking he knew best. Right. And yet, uh, there he was. So we can only hope uh, that uh, if he did have a deep respect for this bird's nest uh, master, and if he heard his words, uh, he, he kind of got it. Uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, any questions uh, about uh, this, uh, what has been shared today? Yes. Um, are you saying that all our propensities for anger and well, again, to me that is. Again, uh, so what? What the question? I'm repeating it. Is uh, doesn't Buddhism have an idea of rebirth and reincarnation, so that many of these propensities uh, come from our past life? or past lives, that's what you're asking, and the impressions are carried on. That is a, that is a traditional Buddhist belief. Uh, you know, to me, uh, uh, it is irrelevant. Right? Whether you think uh, these propensities started uh, in this life, or whether you thought they started a hundred lifetimes ago, the bottom line is we have to deal with them now. Do you know what I'm saying? So I think I agree with you, uh, you know, that having that view kind of is a more expansive view. Uh, but the bottom line, uh, uh, whatever uh, you believe has been given us, right, uh, whether it's been given us uh, just from this life or from a hundred lifetimes, it is still our job in this lifetime to awaken. And the teaching of Buddhism is clear. Everybody has that potential to awake, right? We know in the Buddha's own time, uh, a serial killer came to him, a Gunamala, right? who had killed uh, 30 people. And, uh, and the Buddha, uh, and when he met the Buddha, he uh, stopped. He became a follower of the Buddha, and it is said that he achieved uh, the first level of enlightenment. Okay. So uh, I don't know if anybody in this room uh, bears the heavy karma of uh, being a serial killer, right, like Agunamala. Uh, most of, most of us probably are lightweights compared to him, uh, but that shows you, right? Uh, every uh, master says, whatever your karmic propensities are, they are simply that, right? And if one learns to understand what they are and see them clearly and develops meditative capability and insight, one can be free of them. That's really the important thing. Again, uh, w whether one... Uh, uh, it's funny, uh, when I was a professional uh, therapist uh, in the past, I was a clinical hypnotherapist. But I, I was a clinical hypnotherapist. I used it in, in the framework of psychotherapy. Uh, but I would often, uh, or I wouldn't get often, but time to time I get a call, uh, somebody uh, asking me uh, if I would do uh, past life regressions. Right? They want to understand uh, uh, their past lives. And my response was, uh, uh, no, I don't, because... Uh, you know, my sense is most of the people I've run into uh, have enough trouble dealing with what's uh, coming up for them in, in this life without, you know, working through all their past lives. You know, that's like... Uh, again, uh, the Buddha said, 
the Buddha said. If you want to, when people would ask the Buddha uh, about past lives, he said, uh, if you want to know what, your, what, what, what was going on in your past lives, look at how your life has been in this, this life. This is the result of it all, right? I mean, he was very clear. He didn't, even though that was a common belief in India, uh, that, that was not significant to him. Because he said, uh, you know, wh whether you think you, you have uh, one life or ten lives or a million lives, uh, the result of it is manifesting in this life. Right? Again, and when people would ask him about the future, you know, what's going to happen to me in future lives? <laughs> it was the same kind of uh, question. He would say, you know, Look at, you know, look at your condition of your life right now. Right now, in this life, you're making the causes for your future life. And basically, he would say, so therefore what? Therefore, uh, the understanding of past and the understanding of, of where your future going is in your hands right now. This is the place uh, where it meets, right? And this is the place uh, where we practice. And, uh, you know, uh, some of us may feel, ooh, I got a heavy karma. Uh, and many of us have, have had uh, difficult lives, right? I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's no getting away from that, right? Uh, so even at this moment, just for this life, uh, we've all had different uh, lives. Uh, many things have happened to us in this life, and the results of that is different for each of us. But having said all that, right? All of us, if we, uh, if we uh, deeply uh, uh, commit ourselves uh, to a path of healing and transformation, uh, it will occur. There is no doubt about that. Why? Because nothing is permanent. Thoughts, feelings, perceptions are all impermanent, right? Nothing lasts. Nothing has any substance, right? Take your worst thought, your worst fear, your worst memory, and you look right at it, it disappears. It does not stand up uh, to direct looking. Why? Because thoughts aren't real. Memories aren't real. Right? They're made of what? Mind stuff. Right? We know that's true, don't we? But we forget it. And when these thoughts and feelings and memories arise, uh, we treat them as if they're real. They're like they're something. But they're not anything. They're just thoughts. What is a thought? Please investigate that. You may be surprised what you find. They are nothing of substance. So why let our lives be ruled by uh, things that have no substance? Yes. Question from Elena, who's joining us on live stream from Sweden this morning. Uh -huh. Now, the reader question relating to contaminated water and purities, suffering and afflicted emotions, and shit happens. What is Nirvana? According to Buddha, Nirvana is beyond the evil. And in the ultimate sense, there's really no difference between the World War II dictator and the Teresa. Or between a parent raising a two-year-old child with a conditional love of the parent surrounding the two-year-old after a jealousy rage, right? Uh, wrong. And repeat the question. <laughs> well, well, I think everybody heard the question. So the, oh, the, the camera needs to hear. So the questions, I mean, I mean, it was a big question. I mean, it sounds like that's a Dharma talk. So the question seemed to be, what was the question again? Just in a bit. <laughs> so if, if, if that is all true, therefore everything is equal, and whether you're a, a benevolent, uh, compassionate leader, or you're the worst dictator, uh, whether you uh, love and nurture your children, or whether you murder your children, it's all the same. Uh, again, uh, that's a very interesting, I mean, from a, <laughs> you know, when we chant the Heart Sutra, you know, on Death and Nights, we, we chant the Heart Sutra. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. You hear about the relative and the absolute, uh, as if these things are two different worlds. Uh, in essence, they're not. 
because it is said form is emptiness, emptiness is form. So you could say, oh, from the, you know, like people will say, from the absolute, right? The unconditioned. Uh, Helena's question, well, you know, does it matter, right? I mean, does it matter if a child lives or a child dies, right? Does it matter if this world exists? Or, or comes to an end, right? Uh, from the unconditioned, like you can say, from the vast uh, uh, universe of endless worlds, right? And scientists and astronomers have not found any end to this, or a beginning of this. It is endless and beginningless. Uh, does the fate of the Earth matter? Absolutely not. That is the truth. And yet, from the point of view of those of us here on Earth, it does matter. <laughs> right? And that is the meaning of emptiness is form and form is emptiness. It is both. And the point of realization is to understand, to understand both views simultaneously. Right? Yeah, so we could say, uh, you know, from the bigger picture, the fact that 40,000 children die of hunger every day, no, it doesn't matter, does it? In the bigger picture. But from the picture of those 40,000 children and their families and, and the world family, it does matter, doesn't it? It matters deeply. Uh, uh, <laughs> another way of saying it is, you know, with a cockroach, right? Right? I mean, you see a cockroach, kill it, right? right? From the point of view of the bigger picture, the life or death of that cockroach, it doesn't matter at all. Would you agree with me? You know, the world is not going to spin off its axis, uh, you, know, you know, whether this cockroach lives or dies. True? But, from the point of view of that cockroach, whether, whether it gets stepped on or not, does matter. And who knows, that cockroach may have little, little cockroaches that are depending on it. <laughs> who will miss it when it, if it doesn't come home. You know what I'm saying? So it is both and. and. And the key thing is to, when you have that view of both and rather than either or, then you can work with ease. If you don't have, you know, if you, have the, if you only have the big view, uh, then you could become indifferent. Right? You could become callous. Oh, everything is everything. What does it matter? Just karma unfolding. People talk like this. It doesn't matter. You know, everything is everything, and you know, it's all good. You know, people talk like that. But you see, that's a distorted view. That's what once the Buddha talked about. This is the middle way. It's called the Madhyamika, the middle way, which means the, the extreme views are, are brought together as one. So it's neither a view where everything is everything, nothing matters, which is what Helena was worried about. But on the other hand, it's, it's also not that everything matters and so important, right? That's where so much of our unhappiness, our stress, our emotional affliction, because we think what? Everything is important, right? Right? Especially everything in my life is important. I mean, there's nothing more important than my life. Right? You know what I mean? I can't believe there's traffic out here today. I got somewhere to get to. Right? I mean, I don't care about anybody else, you know, their stuff. Right? So we want to find that middle way. Right? Where we... Uh, don't take every tiny little thing totally seriously so we get stressed out and frustrated and anger, right? On the other hand, we don't want to become indifferent. Blah. Like rocks. I mean, the, the, the point of view of Buddhism is not to become a rock. But it's to have a, a, a natural uh, emotional life based on clarity. Yes? Um, in, in, in the Buddhist story, in the mythology, it says that after lots of trials and tribulations, he finally went to the Bodhi tree and sat there for things 40 days, mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. and then kind of finally attained enlightenment or nirvana. Mm -hmm. 
And so when I first read that, I said, well, maybe there will be a day when I, when I reach enlightenment. Mm -hmm. But since practicing things, it seems like I don't know if there is a finality to it. Like there's be one day where I'm finally enlightened or something. I just wondering if you'd share some thoughts on the nature of awakening and enlightenment. <laughs> Reaching a final stage or something like that. Yeah. So the question everybody hears is, uh, you know, in uh, Buddhism, life of the Buddha, uh, the Buddha, you know, had a great enlightenment uh, as, a, as an experience. And you're asking, uh, is that uh, what it's about, having this one great experience? Uh, or, or, is it, uh, or is awakening something else? Uh, in Buddhism, uh, a Buddha uh, means uh, somebody who is awake. Right? When uh, people came to the Buddha and they said, uh, what should we call you? You know, you know, what are you? Are you a god? Are you a demigod? Are you a superhuman? And the Buddha said, uh, no, I am awake. Okay. Uh, but we might say a Buddha is someone who is totally awake. There is nothing obscuring him at all. Okay? He is totally awake. In the same way we talked about spring water is uh, uh, totally pure. Right? But again, uh, so that's the essence, but from the point of view of practice, right? Uh, removing the contaminants is a process, right? Um, every time a contaminant is removed or lessened, uh, we could say the water is a little more pure. When it is totally pure, uh, we can say that's full enlightenment. Uh, it is said in Buddhism, uh, one uh, sort of one one moment of clarity or one moment of insight or one I can't remember exact. Uh, you're a one-inch Buddha, <laughs> right? You know, in a certain sense, if we, uh, if our minds are not too clouded, we realize uh, throughout the day we have moments of mindfulness, moments of clarity, moments of selfless action, right? Uh, in that moment, uh, we are uh, experiencing our true nature. We are no different than a Buddha, uh, but we don't stay there. Right? So we might say that spiritual practice is a, again, uh, nirvana is often translated as cessation of suffering. Right? Uh, when all the contaminants have been removed, uh, when the mind stream is totally pure, uh, one is a Buddha. Right? But uh, th th that is a journey, isn't it? Uh, it is a journey that goes on. Uh, uh, you know, from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep, from the moment uh, we are alive to the moment we die, and maybe, depending on your belief, uh, continuation, continuation too. So along the spiritual journey, there are many awakenings. There are small awakenings, there are big awakenings, there are big aha moments, there are little aha moments. But the bottom line is, to be honest with you, day-to-day -day practice, you know? You can have all the great spiritual experience, meditative experiences you want, but if they cannot be lived, uh, they will not really be beneficial. Uh, for me, the proof of uh, spiritual development is how we conduct our daily life. Right? That's the proof. And uh, if we have uh, meditative understandings, we have insights, uh, then they need to be lived. So again, the, the, the journey is a journey of awakening, becoming more and more awake, more and more conscious, more and more aware, clearer, brighter. Right? Uh, and again, it's not, it's not linear, right? We will sometimes feel we're really getting somewhere, and then the next day we'll feel like, wow, I really am nowhere. <laughs> right? And that just... You know, I mean, the more we practice, the more those even out. Uh, but the more that we begin to see there is a, there is a movement here, right? There is a movement. And, uh, and again, that movement can be uh, speeded up uh, by if we nurture it. 
the more we meditate, the more we study, the more we are involved in those kinds of activities, the more we practice, uh, the process gets speeded up. Good. Uh, so why don't we stop? Thank you.